This episode of Paradigm Profiles is called High Control Parole. During the 60s and 70s, the Mexican Mafia and the Nuestra Familia were engaged in a full-scale war. The war was being fought to maintain dominance and control over all the main lines in the California prison system. Following a number of events that transpired in Folsom, San Quentin, Chino, and DVI, the MA and the AB forged an alliance and established a symbiotic working relationship. Together, in unison, they were able to maintain control over all the money, drugs, prostitution, and gambling rackets that were up and operating on the main lines. These two groups had fierce reputations back in these days, and because of their willingness to commit overt acts of violence on anyone who wasn't aligned with them, they were extremely feared by the non-affiliated inmates. An alliance between the NF and the BGF hadn't completely developed yet. These two groups were still running solo. However, ensuing events would eventually lead them to join forces. Sporadic incidents occurred in DVI and San Quentin where the BGF aided the NF who were being attacked by the AB members. Coincidentally, some of these hits that the ABs were conducting on lone NF members were actually being effectuated to assist their allies, the Mexican Mafia. But the tensions between the BGF and the AB was already heating up. On January 16, 1967, an inmate named Robert Holderman, who was considered to be a Nazi prison gang associate, got into a verbal disagreement with several African American inmates. The argument started on the weight pile and incidentally stemmed from Holderman taking several dumbbell weights that belonged to the black inmates. At the time, Holderman inconspicuously attempted to steal the dumbbells. He thought he was being slick, but ended up getting spotted by the three BGF members who were also on the weight pile. This was right before San Quentin's final 2.30 lockup. As soon as Holderman grabbed the dumbbells and threw them on the opposite side of the weight pile, the three BGF members confronted him about it. Holderman flat out denied taking the weights and allegedly responded by making a racial slur. In those days, the weights had color markings on them to distinguish what group of inmates they belonged to, so there was no denying it. What started out as just an issue over prison real estate now ended up turning into a deadly conflict during the time when racial tensions were as high as they ever were. This was also an era where disrespect in the form of racial epithets wasn't tolerated or accepted and usually resulted in someone getting their wig split. And that's exactly what happened. The three BGF members stabbed and beat Holderman to death right there on the way pile before anyone had a chance to come to his aid. Holderman wasn't a member of the AB, however, he was considered to be a known Nazi prison gang associate who was a strong AB sympathizer. I'm sure the administration expected there to be some pushback or some retaliation by the white inmates, but they didn't give them a chance to do anything that day and the prison went on its regular 2.30 lockdown. On January 17, 1967, the following day, the retribution came and it came as a full court press. 1,800 black inmates and 1,000 white inmates clashed on the main yard at San Quentin behind the death of Holderman. This to date is one of the biggest racially motivated riots that occurred in the entire history of San Quentin. Unbelievably, there wasn't a single inmate killed that day. These guys went at it in an all out brawl but nobody died that day. As the group continued to prosper, it was also in the process of building and reorganizing its upper echelon. Barry Byron Mills, one of the group's future leaders, was 19 years old in 1967 and was just getting ready to enter into the prison system. He wound up getting arrested in Ventura County and was then transferred to the Sonoma County Jail where he and fellow inmate Buddy Coleman coordinated an escape. The escape consisted of overpowering a correctional officer, taking his keys, and slipping out a side door. A few months later in 1968, the Byron was arrested again in Windsor, California. Because the escape didn't involve any real acts of violence, he was sentenced to one year and one day in prison. And at the age of 20, the Byron entered the California prison system. Meanwhile, tension between the BGF and the AB finally came to a head on January 13th. 1970. Small skirmishes between the two groups continued to break out, but this incident that occurred in Soledad State Prison 
will go down in the history books as one of the defining incidents that solidified the two groups. On one hand, it solidified the alliance, and on the other hand, it solidified the deadly conflict that these groups would now become embroiled in. Again, the incident occurred on January 13, 1970, when AB leader Buzzard Harris and fellow Aryan Brotherhood members Smiley Hoyle, Harpo Harper, and Chuka Wendecker, along with Mexican Mafia members Colorado Joe Arias, John Fernini, and Raymond Guerrero, battled black guerrilla family members on the exercise yard at Soledad State Prison. Tower guard Opie Miller, who was a known self-proclaimed racist and AB supporter, opened fire with his high-powered rifle killing BGF leader W.L. Nolan, Cleveland Edwards, and Alvin Miller. He also managed to shoot AB leader Buzzard Harris in the groin, but this was done by complete accident. The assassination of these three BGF members was clearly motivated by this guard's hatred for blacks, and that's exactly how it was interpreted. W.L. Nolan was a close friend of fellow inmate and fellow revolutionary George Jackson. And because the killing of these three BGF members was so obvious, this resulted in George Jackson using every bit of his influence to declare war against the administration and white racist guards like Opie Miller. Immediately after this incident, a movement was assembled by black prisoners and by black activists alike for the sole purpose of ensuring that Opie Miller be prosecuted for these killings and to also call for his firing. Of course, to make matters worse, and to add insult to injury, Miller was not prosecuted. He was completely cleared of all wrongdoing, and he was also allowed to keep his job. This infuriated African American inmates, and again triggered the revolutionary movement, led by George Jackson and the BGF, vowing to kill correctional officers every month during August. By this time, the NF and the BGF had began working together and started to establish a strong alliance of their own. But this alliance was also supported beyond the walls of prison. It was actually already formulating on the streets as the Black Panther Party began supporting and marching with the Cesar Chavez movement and the United Farm Workers Union on the streets. However, one other incident would end up transpiring between the NF and the AB that would solidify the war between these groups. This incident would result in the NF declaring the AB an official enemy on the same footing as the Mexican Mafia. A full-fledged enemy that they would end up hating almost as much as the BGF hated them. On April 21st, 1972, Aryan Brotherhood members Fred Mandarin and Donald Hale murdered NF member Fred Castillo by stabbing him to death in the Chino Institute for Men. This killing had nothing to do with any conflict Castillo had with the AB, and that's what made it personal. The AB murdered Castillo as part of a contract and a pact with the Mexican Mafia. These two ABs caught Castillo alone and took turns holding him down while they stabbed him to death. This was the final piece that staged the war between these four groups, and all the lines had now been drawn. Over the course of the next 20 years, the war continued to escalate. There were a number of killings that occurred, killings on all sides, but the 80s were unquestionably a turbulent and tempestuous time for all four of these groups, especially the Aryan Brotherhood. The Byron's criminal career took off in 1976 when he started plotting and scheming with other AB members to rob banks. He was eventually caught two years after a bank was hit in Fresno, California. Although the Byron didn't actually participate in the 1976 robbery, he provided a blueprint for it. The case was ugly, but he had his hands tied as far as defending it, so he jumped on the deal. They basically railroaded him and gave him 20 years in federal prison after several people came forward willing to testify and several members defected. On May 20th, 1979, a year after he was sentenced to federal prison, the Byron began proving his loyalty to the AB after murdering AB associate John Sherman Marslov at the United States prison in Atlanta, Georgia. In 1980, the following year, the AB set up a commission to run the operations of all the AB members in the federal prison system. The commission was composed of three men, with Barry Byron Mills assuming command of the commission. Meanwhile, a second Aryan Brotherhood commissioner, 
Thomas Terrible Tom Silverstein was about to add more credentials to his already impending and growing status by killing a federal correctional officer by the name of Merle Eugene Klutz. The incident occurred at the United States Penitentiary, Marion in Southern Illinois. On October 6, 1983, Aryan Brotherhood Commissioner Thomas Silverstein, aka Terrible Tom, got into a verbal disagreement with Officer Klutz. The disagreement stemmed from Silverstein feeling like Klutz was singling him out and riding him over whatever petty issues Klutz could come up with. After confiscating several items out of Silverstein's cell that Klutz deemed to be contraband, the growing conflict between the two turned personal. Silverstein felt like Klutz was focusing his disparities on him personally and drew the line when Klutz confiscated some of Silverstein's cherished art supplies. That was the final straw. During the routine shower program, Silverstein stuck his handcuffed arms through the bars of another inmate's cell, where the inmate used a key to unlock the cuffs, and then the inmate handed him a prison-made weapon. Silverstein then lunged at Klutz and proceeded to stab him over 40 times for what he described as disrespecting him. Officer Klutz died. At the same prison, a few hours later, Officer Bob Hoffman was also stabbed 35 times by AB member Clayton Fountain who was quoted as saying he didn't want Terrible Tom to have a higher body count than me. By this time, another up-and-coming AB member by the name of Robert Scully begins to emerge and is on a mission to earn his bones. On February 7, 1984, AB member Robert Scully assaults a fellow inmate at San Quentin. Scully stabs the inmate and nearly kills him in the West Block Rotunda. When asked by a fellow AB member what the incident was about, Scully stated that he was in a bad mood and that that bastard pissed me off. It became apparent early on during Scully's incarceration that he obviously developed a deep hatred for authority figures and especially correctional officers who worked at the prisons. He hated the COs telling them to do anything and when encountering situations that would usually just be part of everyday prison life, i.e. having his cell searched, being told to take pictures down he had on his wall in his cell, or just any directive coming from a CO period, it would escalate with him to the point of him getting rolled up or getting into a physical altercation with them. Kind of similar to how I told you guys I used to feel whenever I'd get one of them COs that acted like he was walking the dog whenever he was escorting me somewhere. On April 27, 1984, Scully apparently was once again in a bad mood as he tried to stab a prison guard who searched his cell and confiscated his extra laundry. The CO who searched his cell wasn't targeting Scully and it wasn't personal. He was only performing the weekly quota of cells that he was required to search. But Scully took it personal nonetheless. This incident right here ended up getting Scully sent back to the administrative segregation but surprisingly enough, no disciplinary charges were filed and he was just held in ADSEG pending review. The AB had a lot of sway with the administration and certain COs at different institutions and this was something that they used to their advantage. This afforded them with the ability to deal with these officers on a personal level without having to worry about the typical fallout or backlash that it usually would. And Schooley was definitely one of a few who was making the most of it. The AB obviously had a different mindset than some of the other groups when it came to assaulting staff and engaging in these types of frivolous conflicts. The NF and the MA, on the other hand, have always taken on a much more modest and conservative approach whenever it's come to getting in the conflict with officers. If it absolutely had to be done, then they do what they had to do, but for the most part, it's usually avoided. This is because the NF and the MA don't like to create situations that would tend to interfere, disrupt, or have an adverse effect on the household's daily affairs. When you assault an officer or engage in any type of verbal or physical conflict, then you have to go through the motions of securing your contraband, putting everything away, and getting ready for them to come through with the search teams. Because that's what's going to happen. You fuck with them, they don't play fair. They're going to come through and tear everybody's shit up. And whenever you're part of one of these groups, whether it's a northerner, southerner, white, or black, the COs are always going to apply that one-for-all, all-for-one aphorism. It has a reflection on the whole collective. 
And like I've said before, as inmates, we like our contraband and we don't like having it taken. Anyone that's done time knows this. In prison, respect is everything. That goes for inmates and officers. Everything's predicated on respect. And when those lines are crossed or infringed upon, there's always a reaction. That's why it's best to avoid the petty conflicts when it's at all possible. What's more important? That's what you gotta ask yourself. Sometimes it's better to pick your battles instead of allowing yourself to be baited or drawn in, especially when considering the repercussions. The Africanos are another example. They despise the COs and have a long history of getting into it with them, not only because of the whole political prisoner play or the revolutionary movement, but instead, like the AB, they just tend to act on impulse and it's often effectuated with no thought or concept of consequence. A situation that starts out as a simple form of disrespect ends up escalating into a stabbing or someone losing their life. Don't get me wrong, the NF or the MA won't tolerate being disrespected or targeted by the COs or their aggressions either. There's a big difference. But like I said, when at all possible, it's avoided. The following day on April 28, 1984, the day after Scully was moved to ADSEG, he ended up gassing two COs on the tier during evening feeding. Gassing is a term that describes the act of an inmate filling up a cup with either feces or a caustic substance and then hurling it in the face of a CO or another inmate. When you're in ADSEG in San Quentin, they have a roll cart that they push down the tier during feeding. So they literally serve you breakfast and dinner right there in front of yourself. Scully was apparently upset with the ration of food he was served by the two officers and felt like he was bamboozled out of his chicken and potatoes. <laughs> Scully continued to test the waters, but once again, no disciplinary action was taken. It was brushed off as a personal issue between Scully and the two officers. But I guarantee you, this didn't get him any more chicken and potatoes. However, Scully still wasn't done testing the waters. On May 1st, 1984, Scully finally succeeded in stabbing another one of the COs at San Quentin. This was the result of having got into a verbal disagreement with this officer who was attempting to search Scully's cell. The stabbing was conducted through the bars while the officer was waiting for Scully to strip out and cuff up. As Scully handed the officer his clothing in the course of the strip search, Scully reached through the bars and managed to graze the officer on the arm. The wound was superficial and didn't require medical attention, but Scully still managed to break skin and injure the officer. As soon as this happened, the officer who was stabbed hit his alarm causing dozens of other officers to respond. When Scully was pulled out of his cell and escorted down to the security cages on the first tier, a more thorough search was conducted. During this search, Scully was being invasive and made several futile attempts at trying to expedite the search. It was obvious he was attempting to conceal something as he continued to try bypassing searching protocol and hurry the search along. This only made the COs more suspicious. Because he was obviously trying to hide contraband, he was chained up, his sleeves and the bottoms of his pants were taped up, and he was locked in a cage and placed on potty watch. When they put you on potty watch, they basically have officers take shifts watching you around the clock until you defecate on yourself. Once you do, they then cut off your clothing and retrieve the contraband. Whatever plan Scully might have had, this probably backfired on him because they didn't only find three hacksaw blades that he had keistered in his rectum. <laughs> Why does this remind me of Lecho? They also found two 22 caliber bullets inside his stomach. Apparently, he had swallowed them. Had he just submitted to the initial search in the beginning, they might have just found the hacksaw blades and called it a day. But because he was placed on potty watch, this caused him to defecate the two bullets out along with the hacksaw blades. In light of the fact that they had three hacksaw blades and two live rounds that they physically removed from Schooley's prison wallet, <laughs> you would think that he would have definitely faced some type of disciplinary action for this incident. Once again, he was in fact written up and issued an RVR, Rules Violation Report, CDC 115. However, it's unknown under what basis it was contended on, but all charges were dismissed, and once again, he faced no disciplinary actions. 
Either they rarely picked up shit back in those days or the AB had someone working for them on the inside. The fact that this didn't raise suspicions and that Schooley wasn't being looked at sideways by his own people leads me to believe that they definitely had someone in pocket. On May 29, 1985, a little over a year later, Schooley stabbed another inmate in San Quentin. This was a sanctioned hit by the AB. The inmate that Schooley hit was another white inmate who was accused of committing some type of act of cowardice. When this happened in 85, Scully was back out on the main line and was housed in North Block. The plan was to either hit the target in the chow hall or to hit him on the upper yard coming out of the chow hall. Either way, the purpose for doing it in one of these two areas is because of the high volume of traffic that this would have given Scully and to increase the chances of him getting away. With all the luck he had had up until this point without getting hemmed up, you would think that he would have been okay and that he would have skated again. But apparently, all his luck had finally ran dry. Scully hit the target as they were exiting the chow hall, and as soon as he tossed the weapon and tried to cut away in the opposite direction, the gunner spotted the break in the crowd of inmates and blew his whistle. Scully's shank was confiscated and he was later identified as being the perpetrator. As a result, he was charged with assault on another inmate and sentenced to an additional six years in prison. In September of 1985, the AB continued revising his leadership structure and officially named Tyler the Hulk Bingham to the three-man federal commission. On June 22, 1987, Aryan Brotherhood member Art Rufo attacked a black inmate. Rufo had a shank and tried to murder the black gang member. Officer David Pitts thwarted Rufo's attempt at murder by shooting Rufo in the hip. At the same time, Aryan Brotherhood member Cornfed Schneider attacked another black inmate. The attacks were planned and orchestrated as part of a hit on DC blacks at Folsom Prison. The hits were ordered by Blue Norris, an Aryan Brotherhood councilman. This was the beginning of Hell Week at Folsom Prison. Longtime AB member Cornfed had the honors of kicking it off. On July 7, 1987, during a strip search, Paul Cornfed Schneider reached through an open slot in a security strip cage and stabbed Officer Carl Kropp in the throat. Councilman Blue Norris ordered the hit on Officer Kropp as payback for the shooting of Aryan Brotherhood member Art Rufo. But the AB weren't done with Hell Week yet. Demonstrating the length and depth of the AB's reach, Officer David Pitt who shot at Rufo was wounded by a shotgun blast as he drove to his home in West Sacramento. This was one of the first few cases in California where a correctional officer was assaulted outside of work and it put a lot of officers on edge. By now, Scully had built a reputation for not only having a bad attitude towards correctional officers, but he was becoming known as being highly assaultive. And some COs claim that he wasn't even being provoked. He just seemed to enjoy going after officers for the sake of doing it. On October 10, 1987, Aryan Brotherhood member Robert Schooley, who was usually in a bad mood, continued on in his path forward to assault whoever got in his way. Because of his continued assaultive behavior, he was transferred from San Quentin State Prison to Tehachapi Prison. While there, Schooley was charged with possession of a deadly weapon. The charge was later dropped which by now seemed to be a routine thing for Scully. On December 13, 1990, Scully was transferred to the new maximum security prison at Pelican Bay State Prison in Crescent City, California. Scully was transferred again because of his history of violence and because of his overall propensity to commit acts of violence. From 1990 to 1994, Scully was relatively quiet during the four years he was there. Whether it was because he sensed that Pelican Bay COs were different and that they wouldn't tolerate some of the shit he had done in the past, or whether it was because he just decided to slow his roll. The last four years he spent in Pelican Bay had been quiet and had been problematic free. On February 26, 1994, Scully was released from Pelican Bay State Prison. His parole stipulations consisted of alcohol and narcotic testing and then the usual that they hit everyone with. No contact with other gang members, no contact with other parolees, no criminal activity, etc., etc. The only other stipulations that were specifically stipulated were the gang stipulations. 
he was prohibited from associating with members or close associates of the Aryan Brotherhood. After close to a good 10 year stretch, Scully hit the ground running from the gate, literally. He got himself a pistol, started hitting licks, and was on the fast track to come right back to prison. He was only out on the streets of Southern California for less than a month before he was arrested. On March 24th, 1994, he got snatched up in Newport Beach. He was carrying a loaded 25 caliber pistol and he had a pocket full of false identification. The only bright spot in all this is that the DA declined to pick up the case. So he was given a 12 month parole violation and put back on a bus to Pelican Bay. His parole violation back up in the Bay was also uneventful. He tapped back in with some of the other AB members that were up there, including Cornfed, his Sally Dale Bretches, and Danny, Danny T. Troxel. After knocking out his flat year, he was released again and went through all the motions of parole. At the time, when you parole from Pelican Bay, the parole process was pretty basic and simple. On the day of your release, they dressed you out in your parole clothes, and then they put you on a van that would then drive you off the prison grounds. If you weren't fortunate enough to have a ride there to pick you up, then the van physically drove you to the Greyhound station in Crescent City. That station was probably one of the smallest Greyhound stations I've ever seen. When you walked in, the lobby was only big enough for a soda machine and two small seats. That was it. This is when the transporting officers would hand you your envelope containing your $200 gate money, compliments of the state. After they handed you your money, they'd stand right there with you so they could watch you purchase your ticket. Once you got your ticket, then you go back outside and wait until the bus was good to go. Because most of us were gang members and weren't the kind of people that the community of Crescent City wanted left alone out there to roam the streets, the two transporting officers physically stayed there and waited at this small terminal with you until the bus gassed up and pulled off. I tried to find a picture of the bus station, but it's not even out there anymore. Now, I guess they just have a bus stop that they constructed right outside the prison, as you can see from the picture to the right. I'm assuming this was done to make it convenient for them so that they could just dump you off at the bus stop that's practically on the prison grounds. But like I said, back before everything changed, these transportation officers physically stood there with you until they seen you board the bus and pull off. The only other fucked up thing they did was this. They obviously advised each one of the small liquor stores that were at all the designated stops between Crescent City and Santa Rosa not to sell anyone any liquor on the bus. No doubt because of the fact that you had parolees on the bus. But that's how paroling from Pelican Bay used to be. Then everything changed. Everything would change as a result of the events that began to take place on March 23rd, 1995. Robert Scully was released again after serving another 12 month violation. Only this time, he had someone meet him at the front gate to give him a ride home. Brenda Moore, who was the girlfriend of Paul Cornfed Schneider, drove up to Pelican Bay to pick Scully up. This was indicative of two things. One, Scully was plugged in, and two, the AB obviously had a plan for him. Brenda Moore picked him up at the gate, he got into the vehicle with her, and they drove off. However, they didn't go far. They were expected to drive to San Diego in Moore's truck, but two days later, after having spent time in a motel, they were still in Northern California. On March 26, 1995, Robert Schooley and Brenda Moore murdered Frank Trejo, who was a deputy with the Sonoma County Sheriff's Department. The murder took place in the parking lot of a bar in Sebastopol, California. Officer Trejo apparently approached Scully and the convict who was known to have a bad attitude when it came to law enforcement got into a heated argument with the deputy. The argument escalated fast. Trejo demanded to see identification from Scully and Moore, but this situation was all bad from the beginning. When Moore was told to pick Scully up, she was also instructed to bring a loaded shotgun for him and that's what she did. Things ended up turning physical when Trejo attempted to put handcuffs on Scully for refusing to produce identification. At that point, Scully wrestled Trejo to the ground and with Moore's assistance, they disarmed Trejo. Moore then retrieved the shotgun out of her truck and handed it to Scully. Once Trejo was disarmed, 
and had guns pointed at him. He was basically in their mercy and he did what he was told to do. Schooley hated cops. He made this clear by demonstrating his long assaultive history in prison. Every chance, every opportunity he got to hurt, assault, or stab a CO in prison, he took advantage of it. Now, with that same fury he had always shown and without any level of pity, he had Officer Frank Trejo lie face down on the asphalt. When Trejo complied with his commands, Scully placed the shotgun to the back of his head and without any hesitation, he pulled the trigger. Deputy Frank Trejo was dead before he knew what hit him. Scully and Brenda Moore were both arrested within days of killing Trejo. Moore was sentenced to prison for her involvement in the killing and Scully was ultimately sentenced to death at San Quentin State Prison. The backlash from this case was immediate and the locals all the way from Crescent City to Sebastopol rolled the wave. The public outcry focused on how known violent parolees like Scully were systematically being released from Pelican Bay without proper supervision. Because of this, high risk and high control parole guidelines were imposed in the state of California. This changed the policies and procedures for anyone paroling who had any type of violence in their history or who had been convicted of any type of violent crime. After they revised the policies for anyone who had any type of violence in their background, you were no longer allowed to just parole from institutions like Pelican Bay, Corcoran, Tehachapi, etc, etc. Now, whenever you were within 10 to 14 days of your parole date, they were required to send you to whatever institution was the closest to your county of parole, and your parole officer was now required to pick you up and drive you back to your county of parole. After they made these changes, I was never allowed to parole the way I did in the early 90s when I was allowed to catch a bus at the Greyhound station in Crescent City. During the time when Scully faced trial for killing Deputy Trail, the federal government came down with a sweeping federal indictment charging the Brands, Three Man Commission, and most of the other leadership with the RICO Act. On October 16, 2002, a federal indictment unsealed in Los Angeles charged 40 members and associates of the Aryan Brotherhood with several RICO violations, including murder. The indictment included Rafael Gonzalez Munoz, who was a high-ranking member of the Mexican Mafia, and Joseph Prinsite, who was a federal prison guard. As of 2022, Thomas Terrible Tom Silverstein and Barry Byron Mills have both since died. Corn Fed defected along with other high-ranking Aryan Brotherhood members. Meanwhile, Scully sits on California's death row that is currently under a governor-imposed moratorium. The likelihood of Scully or possibly any other death row inmate on California's death row ever being executed is highly questionable. If California's governor and a growing number of Californians get their way, the death penalty might get abolished altogether. I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode of Paradigm Profiles. For those of you who want to get in the next raffle for the other size 11 and a half, Get your tickets in now as we might hold that raffle this weekend. It's going to depend on how many people participate and what else is going on over the weekend. We also have that 4X Derby raffle we're doing as well. We'll be doing a live tonight updating you guys on everything including the big raffle for the 12 and a half and 13 Jordans. Congratulations to the other winners of last week's raffles. Richie Rich, Valeria, Shadow Pit, and Joshua from the Homie Hangout. Also, get your questions in now, as the next Q&A is already being worked on. For those of you who have questions, put them in any comment section and we'll find them. In closing, PMN would just like to continue to thank all of you who have supported us and who have helped us grow. Without you guys, we would cease to exist.